Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to um, this month's non-farm payrolls webinar. This one for May on Friday, the 2nd of June. With me, Michael Hewson. Um, certainly coming off the back of an interesting few days. Um, in the space of about five days, we've gone from the probability or the likelihood of another rate hike in June to the possibility that we might actually see a skip in June, or as I would like to call it, a hold that'll leave rates unchanged, um, before reassessing whether or not the US economy can cope with any more 25 basis point rate hikes. Because I think that's essentially where we are now when it comes to rate rises. We're pretty much in the area of how many more 25 basis point rate hikes are we going to get? And then it's really a case of when will rates start to come back down again? And certainly I think that's manifested itself in terms of the pricing on the bond markets. I think since the last Fed meeting um, back in May, on May the 4th, the removal of that language that um, basically committed to ongoing rate hikes might be appropriate, the removal of that line pretty much gave an indication that the Fed was going to pause in June. But what they pushed back on in particular was the idea that we'd see rate cuts this year. And that's, I think, what's happened over the course of the past month or so. That's been repriced. Because if you look at the way the US two-year yields have behaved, and you can see that in this Bloomberg chart here, and this does have relevance to payrolls. So, you know, I am going slightly at a tangent at the moment. But if you look at where the, the two-year yield was back in May, on 4th of May, it was down around about 3.65. Since then, it's been up to 4.65, 4.63, so 100 basis points higher. And it's now currently where we are at the moment, which is 4.34. So what's happened is that even though the narrative around the Fed has become slightly more, well, we're near at the end of the rate hiking cycle now, we may have another 25 coming in July perhaps, but certainly not in June. Um, it's the rate cuts that were being priced in for the end of this year have been priced out and potentially been priced out in the first half of 2024 as well. So we've got a Fed funds rate of 5, 5 to 5.25%. Bond yields are higher. They are starting to come down now. And this is particularly interesting given the fact that we shot up to those peaks at the end of last week. And in the last three days, we've come back down quite hard. And I think a large part of that, it's not just been, it's not just been about Philip Jefferson's comments yesterday about today's payrolls numbers or about the data in general. Because the big the big decline that we saw um, at the end of May, on the 30th of May, was pretty much as a result of weaker than expected inflation readings coming out of not only the euro area, but the weaker China numbers, the, the, the weak China data, which suggests that the Chinese economic recovery is operating on fumes. So, you know, for, for me at the moment, the fact that yields have, appear to have topped out would appear to suggest that we're in a place now where it's really all about the timing as to whether or not we see the end of this current rate hiking cycle. Because I think if we do pause in June, there's no guarantee that we'll hike in July. Um, but much will depend on the payrolls numbers um, and looking looking at the payrolls numbers i think the bar has been lowered in terms of what to expect when it comes to future rate hike expectations because we also have a cpi reading due on the 13th of june the day before the fed meeting on the 14th of june so um, one of the things that new um, the, the Fed governor, Philip Jefferson, said, and he's also in line, he's been nominated to be the vice chairman. He said, skipping a rate hike at a coming meeting would allow the Federal Open Market Committee to see more data before making decisions about the extent of additional policy firming. So 
the removal of the line in June, the removal of the line in May about um, further rate hikes, that basically doesn't pre-commit the Fed to hiking this month. Those comments yesterday also don't pre-commit the Fed to hiking this month, which would suggest that we need to see a massive outlier one way or the other on the payrolls numbers to suggest that we would get a hike in June. And certainly the inflation numbers that we've seen out of Europe, and more broadly, I think, if you look at China's inflation numbers, they've been very weak. Factory gate prices in China have been negative since October last year. And if you work on the basis that China generally tends to export its inflation and deflation problems, you look at energy prices, you look at commodity prices, there is a disinflationary impulse pushing out. The big question is where that disinflationary impulse stops in terms of where inflation is now. So US inflation is at 4.9% for April. It's expected to come down to 4.1% in May on the headline number, but core prices are currently at five and a half. And that's what the Fed is really concerned about now. And that's what central banks more broadly are more concerned about. The bigger question is having come off the back of 10 successive rate hikes, and that's what we're talking about here. We've seen central banks hike at successive meetings over the course of the past 12 to 15 months. Bank of England, ECB, Federal Reserve. So watching the data allows these central bankers to filter out um, or pass the effects of the rate hikes, which generally tend to operate with a lag. Now, I've been asked the question, is the US dollar topping? Does the dollar can't seem to rally. Can we see stock markets going lower with dollar lower? That is the million dollar question. We've seen an awful lot of divergence when it comes to stock market performance this week. We've seen weakness. In the CAC Caron, we've seen weakness in the FTSE 100. The DAX is around about flat, but we've seen massive outperformance in the NASDAQ. I mean, the NASDAQ has gone completely gangbusters, but the problem with the NASDAQ is, is, is the breadth that we've seen, the number, of, the number of stocks that have driven the NASDAQ higher over the course of the past week or so. So, you know, and for me, that is, that is the real concern, I think, going forward, if you look at the performance of the NASDAQ over the past few days, um, you've got to ask yourself, um, you know, is that sustainable? I mean, this is the last five days for the NASDAQ. Um, obviously, it's not including today. So since last week, the NASDAQ 100 is up 6%. Marvell Technology, NVIDIA, 32% up over the last six days, 30% up. You've got Adobe, you've got Broadcom, um, you've got Tesla, Qualcomm. There's very much an AI, artificial intelligence, um, you know, sort of angle to that. But if you compare that to, say, for example, um, the Dow Jones, so we go Dow Jones or Indu, as it is there, there we go. It's up 0.8%. And then if you then go and do the, the DAX, up 0.1%, and then the FTSE 100. Oops, missed that, MR, there we go, that's here today, okay, uh, five days, down 0.15, so you know, you get the general picture, there's massive divergence in what's going on with respect to um, stock markets at the moment. Now, with respect to the dollar, the dollar at the moment is coming off, we've seen it in dollar yen, We've also seen it in euro dollar. So keeping an eye on the time, we've got eight minutes, so we've got plenty of time. We do appear to have posted a bullish reversal on the on the euro dollar chart here, uh, a bullish daily candle. The big question here is, can we take out that 107.80 level, which is this resistance line here, but more importantly, 108, 108.25. That for me, I think 108.25 is the key level on euro dollar. I still think we're in a broad a broad range on euro dollar. The bigger question is how many more rate hikes has the ECB got in it? I certainly think that we're probably only going to get 25 basis points from the ECB later this month, even if the Fed 
stays on hold in June, we're probably going to get another 25 basis points from the Bank of England. So I think there's a sterling angle to the euro dollar trade, but certainly I think we may well have seen a short term base in euro dollar, assuming, of course, that we don't get a really strong payrolls number um, this afternoon. Because if we get a strong payrolls number, and I'm talking, say, 260 plus, um, we also get um, we also get a strong wages number, then you could well see the dollar head back higher. But on the, on the basis of the dollar index and on the basis of what yields are telling me at the moment, yields are telling me that potentially we've seen a little bit of a top and we could start to drift lower. I don't think we're going to come crashing off. Um, certainly, that's not what the um, that's not what the charts are telling me. If we look at the Nasdaq on this particular chart here, we can see that we've pushed significantly through the 61.8 level here. My biggest concern here about this is how far can you push it? But I'm not a big fan of trying to pick the top in anything. Um, at the moment, the trend is higher. And until such times as we get evidence that um, that trend is over, then it's very dangerous to push back against it. The key support area for me on this NASDAQ chart is this impulse low here that we saw in the aftermath of that push there. So it's around about 14,200. So if we break below that, then we could well see a little bit of a drift lower. But I'm very much, when I'm looking at markets and looking at charts, I'm looking at trends and momentum. And at the moment, the momentum is fairly positive when it comes to the NASDAQ. Um, with respect to the DAX, we're range trading. So we're really interesting that we've managed to hold this line um, pretty much since April, around about 14,000, sorry, 15,000, well, what's that low there? That low is there, 15,600. So 15,600, there or thereabouts, has acted as a fairly decent support level. But on the flip side of that, we've really struggled to get anywhere above 16,280. So we're very much in a range trade when it comes to European markets, but we, it does suggest to me that we've potentially got more upside than downside. Similarly, with the FTSE 100, once again, um, we tried to go lower. We've seen a modest rebound over the past couple of days. What I want to see is a move back above 7,600, but there does appear to be appetite, particularly on markets like the CAC, like the FTSE 100, like the DAX, for um, steady steady dip buying. And I've certainly seen no evidence to suggest that that will change. My main concern, obviously, is around US markets and the distortions that are being created by the tech moves that we're seeing. We're seeing it in the Hang Seng um, earlier today with a big tech move higher there. We also saw it significantly. Um, we've also seen it obviously in the S&P and the NASDAQ. Um, certainly um, dollar yen, WTI, yep, certainly talk about dollar yen. I'm still of the opinion um, that dollar yen should go lower. Now at the moment, that this is one particular trade that I've got massively wrong. Um, and it's really, I think, more about timing than anything else. But if, you, if your view is that the narrative is shifting when it comes to US rate hikes, then certainly I think we are near a top and certainly 140 is probably part and parcel of that. But we also need to remember that the Bank of Japan is meeting in two weeks time. And, you know, at the moment, I'm, you know, I'm struggling to sort of time as to when they're going to change the yield curve control policy. And at the moment, you know, it's got to be sooner rather than later. You know, inflation in Japan is trending above target. Um, but before I get onto that, um, so for me, I, th I think dollar yen can go lower. I think we've seen a short term top. But before we get there, we've got to talk about the numbers, the non-farm payrolls numbers, because I just looked at the time and it's 13.28. We're looking for 195 on the headline number. Um, we're also looking for wage growth of around about 4.4%. And we're looking for unemployment to tick up from 3.4 to 3.5%. Now, I'm less concerned about the unemployment number than I am about the participation rate, which is currently at 62.6. And, you know, essentially um, at the highest level since it's been 
um, post-pandemic. Um, and I'm looking for, for, for further gains there. We've seen a very strong ADP number earlier this week, which suggests that the jobs market still remains fairly robust. And um, the wages numbers, which are still, which are now actually, or likely to remain above the headline inflation number of 4.4%. So we've got about a minute to go. So as long as, infla as, long as wages come in around about 4.4, 4.5%, payrolls above 200, 250. I mean, a really strong number is going to be 250 plus, which was what the April numbers were. Um, it'd be interesting to see if we get significant downward revisions to the previous months. But ultimately, I don't expect us to see the dollar weaken much above 108.20. Um, but and if we do get, you know, if we do get a, if we do get a stronger number for the euro to drop much below 107.20. Um, given what was said yesterday by Jefferson, I think this number is likely to be less important than perhaps markets think that it is. But certainly, I think it will cause an awful lot of questions to be asked about whether or not the Fed will hike or skip in June. Anyway, and here are the numbers. So 3.39. OK, well, that puts a hike back on the table. 3.39 on the headline number. That is a huge number. Um, let's look at the other numbers. The unemployment rate, 3.7, 3.7. So that is significant as well. Um, participation rate is exactly the same. And wages are 4.3. Well, take the bones out of that because I'll tell you something, that is... That is just unbelievable. And there's a two-month payroll net revision higher of 93,000. Well, Euro dollars done pretty much nothing on that. Let's have a quick look. I mean, that's a quick spike lower, stronger dollar, but it's come straight back. Because everyone's looking at the unemployment rate and, uh, and trying to figure out why the unemployment rates jumped up from 3.4 to 3.7% when you've seen change in private payrolls of 283, the loss of 2,000 manufacturing jobs, and a headline number of 339. I haven't seen a revision to April's yet, but there's certainly been a positive revision over the two-month period of 93,000. So very much a dollar positive number. Um, I can't imagine that is going to be particularly positive for the NASDAQ. Let's have a quick look at US two-year yields. Yeah, what a surprise, they're higher. Let's just quickly change that chart to a one-day chart so that you can see the reaction of the US two-year yield. Yeah, no surprise there. So dollar stronger. See dollar yen higher. Um, so dollar yen, I'm still a, I am still a seller of dollar yen on rallies um, for the time being, given the fact that we're heading towards the Bank of Japan on the 16th of June, which will follow the Fed on the 14th of June, uh, and the fact that at some point they are going to have to start looking at tweaking their yield curve control um, policy and starting to tighten monetary policy ever so slightly as we head into the end of the year. So I'm very much seller of rallies on dollar yen. Um, as for WTI, because I didn't answer the second part of your question, Leanne, and I will, um, let's just quickly pop that to one side there, WTI. For me, I think the downside is going to be limited on WTI, very much so to the levels that I've highlighted here with that horizontal line across the bottom, $65 a barrel, simply on the basis of the fact that US is, US is a buyer anywhere below $70 a barrel because it needs to refill the strategic petroleum reserve between now and August. And it's and it's already said that it will be seeking to do that um, between the prices of $65 and $70 a barrel over the course of the, of the next few weeks and months. On the upside, again, I think it's a range trade. You can certainly see the way that it's played out over the last few so far this year. It's fairly well capped, just below 80, just above $80 a barrel. And I don't expect that to change. I think demand isn't likely to be as strong as perhaps people think it will be. 
I still think the cost of living is squeezing people and essentially it means that they will have much less money to spend but I also think that demand isn't likely to be as great as perhaps OPEC thinks that it is or will be because of the stuttering China story. So um, could production cuts put a floor under it? Yeah, absolutely. I'll put, you know, certainly put a floor under it and uh, drive prices higher. Yeah, they could, but the last production cut didn't. And they do need to be a little bit careful about cutting too aggressively because ultimately they could create the very um, they could create the very demand destruction that they're seeking to avoid. So, um, for me, I think I think I think oil is very much range bound at the moment, um, with fairly decent buying interest anywhere below um, these levels between 65 and 67, 68 dollars a barrel on WTI. So I don't expect that to change. Um, a weakening dollar story. That's a, that's a tricky one. I mean, let's talk about it in the context of, say, for example. Um, next week's rate decisions from the RBA and the Bank of Canada. Um, if you're betting on a China recovery story, then probably the Aussie dollar is not the best place to look. But having said that, um, you do have the fact, the small manner of the fact that we've got the RBA next week. And last month, they hiked rates by 25 basis points, catching pretty much everyone on the hop. And there is a, there is a case for saying that perhaps the RBA is behind the curve in the same way that the ECB is behind the curve. Um, that said, um, if you're looking at a weakening dollar story, um, I'm trying to think, you know, perhaps dollar yen, because the Bank of Japan has got more scope to tighten policy than pretty much every other central bank. But, you know, again, trying to time that has been problematic, as I can testify, given the fact that, um, I've been calling for a lower dollar yen since it was around about 133 and it's now 138 and it's been up to 140. So what do I know? Um, but, you know, the trick is in the context of that particular play, it's about what I think central banks are going to do going forward. So f for me, I still think dollar yen is probably the best play um, in terms of the amount of potential downside there is, or, you know, I want to say downside. I don't mean downside in terms of getting your position wrong, but in terms of, I think the dollar yen can go back to 125 uh, by the end of this year, which suggests that you know there's certainly quite a bit of there's certainly quite a bit of potential for a lower dollar the year, lower dollar there than there is, say for example, in the Aussie dollar, which here is very much a play on China. Now there was some reports this morning. Um, that China is looking at another stimulus program, and that's what's been driving markets higher today, particularly in the miners where you've got Antofagasta up 6%, you've got Rio Tinto up 4%, and you've got companies like Glencore's, Glencore and Anglo-American also doing very well, as well as copper prices. But, um, you know, for me, if you look at the, tri the China trade numbers, which are due out next week, they're likely to paint a picture of a fairly weak and subdued economy and that's why we've seen commodity prices look as weak as they have been over the course of the past few days so um i think i think for me dollar yen is probably the is probably the play the problem with that is timing it uh, and i think currently um for me i would be looking to sell any rebound back towards 140 with a stop loss above the recent highs for a move lower in dollar yen. If that's, you know, if, if you basically held a metaphorical gun to my head, that's probably the way I would play a weaker dollar story in terms of dollar yen. Um, right. Commodity currencies. Big week next week, as I said, it's for the Bank of Canada um, and the RBA. I talked about the Aussie a little bit. As I say, I can't see the RBA going for another rate hike. They might. They might, particularly if they're worried that they're behind the curve. But given what we've seen this week with respect to weaker pricing when it comes to commodity currency, commodities, agricultural, as well as metals, I think they may, they may well hold fire. And I think it's going to be a similar story for the Bank of Canada as well. Um, if we look at this particular chart here, um, again, we, we're very, very much in a range on dollar CAD. Maybe we could probably draw a line on this particular chart. Nice little trend line through here. 
it's coming through there. So we could see the CAD drop back down to around about these sorts of levels here and then go for a bit of a rebound. Um, particularly if the Bank of Canada is hawkish, it did it did keep rates on hold at the last meeting. But since that April meeting, when they kept rates at four and a half percent, April CPI nudged up to 4.4 percent year on year, while core prices were also a little bit firmer as well. So and the labour market um, we saw a fairly strong jobs report as well. So maybe the maybe the Bank of Canada may keep rates on hold, but they might they may may issue a little bit of hawkish guidance, which could um, push the Canadian dollar a little bit higher in the short term and back towards that uh, trend line that I outlined earlier. Um, those payrolls numbers certainly haven't hurt um, stock markets, and I think one of the reasons for that is um, the rise in the unemployment rate. If I cast your mind back to the last set of Fed projections, um, they were talking about getting unemployment back to 4.5% by the end of this year. Well, we just jumped by 0.3% in the space of a month to 37 So, you know, maybe um, the fact the unemployment rate has jumped the way that it has, it's got markets starting to think more carefully about the prospect that the Fed actually could hit its unemployment target if unemployment if unemployment starts to head back to that 4%. So um, that's certainly an interesting one to um, get our head get our heads head up, get our heads round. Easy for me to say in the short term. Right, we've got that revision from the April payrolls numbers. That's been revised up, not surprisingly given the fact there was a 93,000 upward adjustment from 253,000 to 294,000. So 294,000 in April. Um, obviously, March was adjusted higher as well. Um, and 339,000, obviously, in May. So once again, um, US payrolls have beaten expectations, beaten the benchmark for the 13th month in a row. Is there no end to the resilience of the US labor market? So, to conclude, today's payrolls numbers keep the prospect of a 25 basis point hike in June on the table, um, but only ever so slightly. I think what will probably tip the scales one way or the other is the CPI numbers when they come out on the 13th of June, which is the day before. And if we see evidence that core prices are slowing, then I think a pause is still very much a plausible scenario or a hold or a skip, whatever you want, a hop, skip and a jump, you know, all these different adjectives I do my head in. Right, I've just been asked something completely off topic here about Ocado. And uh, it is slightly off topic because it's not really, <laughs> Um, but I will humor you. Um, so I will humor you and do Ocado for you. So let's see if we can dig that out. I have to say I don't like Ocado because um, they don't. They, they always promise to make a profit, and thus far they've done. They're as far away from making a profit as they were two or three years ago. Well, that chart tells me that um, there's a definite trend in place there. And uh, my thoughts are, don't try and catch a falling knife. I think at the next reshuffle, Ocado will find itself catapulted out of the FTSE 100. Um, it survived by the skin of its teeth this month. I really don't know how. But um, I would certainly not be looking to buy it quite yet. And I'm guessing that's probably why you're asking me. Having said that, we're still well above the levels we were back in 2017. So, but yeah, I mean, this there was a lot of optimism there, a lot of optimism there. But since then, it's really about you know when are you going to deliver some profits for us? And at the moment, we're still waiting. So it depends what you're looking for. Uh, it depends what you're looking for from it. Is my honest answer, Alan? What are you looking for from a card? Are you looking to get in? Or are you, or are you worried about, uh, or are you long of it and uh, want to get out?
anyway um so get in okay well looking at where it is and where it was six years ago there's worse places to get in um you know six year lows not that that's a recommendation before anyone says anything um but yeah uh, the problem is if you get in now you might have to you might have to wear quite a bit of downside so um any other questions, ladies and gents, before I uh, before I wind up? No interest in Dolomex, anybody? I noticed this is an old friend in the uh, in the uh, in the audience who uh, I think I recall had a Dolomex position. I hope hopefully you still haven't got it. Natural gas, natural gas, um, U.S. natural gas, Tom, or U.K. natural gas? U.S. Okay. I wish I'd never asked now, Steve. <laughs> After seeing that. Um, yeah, I mean, looking at natural gas, fairly decent support in and around these lows back in April and May. So certainly I think if you're looking to play levels, that would probably potentially be a fairly decent area to get long in and around these sorts of lows here for fairly decent rebounds, certainly looking at it over the long term. But if we do break below these series of lows, we could well see further losses going forward. But for the time being, there does appear to be fairly decent support coming in um, just below this two level here around these lows down here. Um, so that's natural gas. Dollar max. You're looking for an idea where to buy. You're obviously a sucker for punishment, Steve. Uh, okay. Well, there's very much a trend in place there. Um, but there is a fairly there's a there's a nice area of support in and around the May lows. I think it really depends on whether or not these May lows hold, because at the moment what you've got is lower highs, and you've got lower lows so we're very much in a downtrend on dollar max so if you're looking to get back in i would wait a bit because we we still haven't seen any evidence that a low is in and for me i think um that means that there is potential for us to go a little bit lower if we take out the lows of earlier in may of around about 1740. so in this case you know in terms of dollar max you need to be trading the trend the trend is down so you've got lower highs, lower lows. So I would be looking to sell into rebounds back to 18 on 18 and 19 for a move back towards the lows. I certainly wouldn't be looking to buy in. So, um, well, yeah, exactly. And the swap, as you say, the swap is bad on buyers. Um, do I think summer trading will favour a carry trade? No, I don't. Is a short answer to that question. Um, ba, 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 ba. and um, so I think that's pretty much. I think that's pretty much. Does anyone else want me to cover anything else that I haven't already covered? Um, I need to show you this chart, guys, because this is interesting. Cable. Um, I always look at cable because I used to trade the thing. Um, there's a nice trend line coming in from the 2021 peaks back in May, two years ago, it's currently to where we are now. So big, big level on cable approaching between 126 and 127. If we can break cable 126, 127, then we could certainly see a sharp move up to 130. I've seen no end of notes talking cable down. When I start to see no end of notes talking cable down, I start to think about maybe going long. Why? Because the consensus generally tends to be wrong. You tend to what I call herding or grouping. Now, that doesn't mean they're wrong all the time, but certainly I think a trade can get so one sided that sometimes it's not a bad idea to take the other side of that trade. We are finding that since October, the lows have been getting higher. We are approaching these peaks. We managed to hold above 123. So 123 on cable now is a fairly decent support level for me. And 
you know, I'm fairly constructive on cable while we're above 123, and it also feeds into my slightly weaker dollar so story as well. If we can if we can hold above 123 and take out this trend line and this peak here, then we could well see a very big short squeeze all the way back to 130. Why? Because everybody hates cable. Everybody hates sterling. And when everybody hates something, that's when I start to think, well, maybe I need to have a look at it just to see whether or not it's worth taking a little cheeky punt. Anyway, um, that's, that's my 10 cents worth. Never be afraid to be contrarian, but really do think it through is one of the things I always say. You're not always right, but when you are, you can be right big time. So um, I think that's pretty much it for uh, this month, ladies and gents. Once again, thank you very much for your company. Thank you for your questions. As always, they've been illuminating and insightful. And I look forward to seeing you all again, same time, same place, uh, next month. In the meantime, enjoy the, enjoy the sunshine and enjoy the weekend. And thank you very much for listening. Cheers. Have a great weekend.